Thank you for joining the NBMI experience today. We expect this to be life-changing for you as it has been for us. Let's get right to the word. When he gave me this, I remember he put a couple of faces in my mind and he said, he said, when you're able to bring forth this word, you're going to see change in their lives. You're going to see uh, not only a spiritual, but, and, and hold on to your seats, married women, you're going to see a physical impregnation begin. And when he gave me this word, I remember thinking, Lord, are you serious? I mean, come on, physical? And he took me on a, on a missions trip to Medellin, which I shared with some of you girls and, and guys, and, and I was able to pray over some lives that were, um, that were unable to have children. And I remember how a week after I came back, I started getting phone calls of people that were unable to have kids, and they were calling me and telling me, Pastor, you prayed for me, and I'm pregnant. And then another person called me and said, Pastor, you prayed for me. And, and you know, Abigail was the first, she was the first of her kind where, where God called her out by name, but God called out children by name of people that weren't even impregnated yet in that place. And, and I remember one of the children was Samuel. And I remember recently I was talking to Pastor David and he was telling me, and Samuel is doing great. He's about to come forth. And, and in my mind, I'm like, who is Samuel? And, and, and I had to do a double take. I said, Samuel? He goes, yeah, the son of so-and-so. And I said, oh, Samuel. She goes, yeah. He goes, yeah, that, that's who I'm talking about. And, and then, you know, it goes further. And, and there's a reason why I'm going to this. And it goes further because I remember... You know how we all have mockers, amen? And I, I remember during that time, there was a person that was mocking one of the people that was prayed for and got impregnated. And they said, well, if your God is so big and bad and he was able to get you pregnant, then why don't you pray over me and let me get pregnant? Another person that was having complications with pregnancy. So this person did exactly that. She felt challenged. So she reacted, she prayed over this person, and within a week's time, she was pregnant as well. Then, I speak to Pastor David, and Pastor David tells me, he goes, Pastor Joel, any woman that you touch ends up pregnant. I said, wait a second, that don't sound right. So, no bueno is right. But there is an incredible move of God, an incredible process that God has this church in. And to be honest with you, and, and this is me, being the pastor of the church, looking at it from my perspective, a lot of times I don't see it. You know, I sit there and I'm like, Lord, what's going on? You, 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 look, I, this is how I talk to God. I say, Lord, you, you talk such a big game. And I hear such big things about you. But what, what's going on, Lord? And, and it takes me back to what I said in the beginning about appreciation. You know, God does these great things, like everything I just mentioned to you. And it kind of goes in one ear for my part and goes out the other. You know, God is, is, has used us to heal people with AIDS. God has used us to heal people with cancer. God has used us to heal people with different varieties of sicknesses. But it kind of, amen, and that's great. But it goes in through one ear and it comes out the other. I'm talking about my own ears. I'm not talking about just the people who heard about it. And... And, and it takes me to the point where I just realized that there's such a lack of appreciation. It, it's really a, a, a lack of faithfulness in the small. Because if we can't cherish and appreciate and embrace, embrace the small things, quote-unquote small things that God does, then how can we ever expect to be in something bigger? Can I get an amen? And, and as God was giving me this word, I remember I was in a plane and, and, and the title, I was like, Lord, what kind of title do I, you know, what do I give? What do I do? And he goes, are you pregnant? And I said, what do you mean, Lord, am I pregnant? I'm a man, I can't be pregnant. He goes, are you pregnant? And I said, Lord, you got to give me more. And, and he took me to the point where he starts talking to me about relationships and how in every relationship there's benefits. And we can never enjoy the fullness, as you can see this, as you, you will never enjoy the fullness of a relationship without allowing the process to take course. If you get married, amen, if you get married and your idea and your mutual ideas are to be able to have a child, your relationship is good before you have the child and up to the point you have the child. But what if you have problems having that child? Come on. Let's be real. What if, what if the doctor tells you you can't get impregnated? 
What if the doctor tells you you have a, a low sperm count or you have weak sperm? Come on, we're all adults. I think we can talk like this. We're big boys and big girls. What if the doctor told you that and, and your relationship got to the point where you were about to take the biggest step in life, but now there's something that's telling you you can't do it? Your relationship changes. It doesn't go the same route because you're both anxious, you're both desiring something, but you don't see the result that you want. And then starts the fights. Not fights based upon theoretically what you can't get, but you become more sensitive. And you start straying away from that person. And you push away more and more from that person. You may say, Pastor, what does this have to do with us? The same exact thing that happens to that couple happens between us and God. We get to that point in relationship where we hear about this baby. Let's talk about this baby as the promise. Come on. And God comes and he puts his hand over you and he says, I have ordained you to be a X, Y, and Z pastor elder, evangelist, whatever your call is, I have ordained you to preach my word. I have ordained you to be a prophet in my house. And you get so excited and you get so giddy about it and you want to do it right away, but you got to prepare for it. And the process of preparation comes forth and you work at it and you work at it and you work at it and you work at it. But comes the day where you're confronted with the fact that you don't see the end result that you want. In other words, you're not able to give birth, you're not able to be pregnant, and now your relationship with God starts pushing away. Anybody felt or understand what I'm talking about here today? Amen. That's the real people. The real people tell you, yeah, pastor, there's times where I don't want nothing to do with God. I love the real people. I love the people who come up to me and say, Pastor, I'm upset at God. And you may say, but what do you want somebody to tell you that? Because I'd rather know where they stand than to them to tell me, I do my tithes, I do my offerings, I do this, I do that. Uh, everything is fine. And you could see right through them that everything isn't fine. And you're trying to get them to the place where they can be open and honest enough to be able to come before the presence of God and say, God, this is how I feel. Because what happens is we, too many of us, live in this religious relationship with God where we're afraid of God. We don't fear God. We don't revere God. We don't respect God. We're just afraid of Him. We, we're, we're, we're distant from Him. We, we have this distance from Him because simply we just don't feel like He's doing His part. Can I get an amen? amen? Now, are you pregnant? Are you currently pregnant? Have, has God released a word, released His seed over your life, and have you been unable to see the produce of that seed? And that's what this is all about over the next couple of weeks. We're going to talk about His seed in us. And have we been able to see the production of His seed in our life? And if not, why? Why don't we see the benefits of this relationship? Why are we not able to experience the goodness that we want to experience? Notice I say want. Because we experience a lot of other goodness, but sometimes we get so focused in on what we want that it doesn't matter what else happens around us, this is what we want. Amen? Points we're going to cover, as we said, why is pregnancy important in a relationship? Number two, how does this relate to our relationship with God? And number three, why give birth? Why is pregnancy important in a relationship? Pregnancy, I just want to give you the definition real quick. It says pregnancy is the physical condition. Pregnancy is the physical condition of a woman or female animal carrying an unborn offspring. Unborn offspring. Now, it's good to have a child. But it's not good to have a child in your womb all the time. Amen? Anyone who has ever been pregnant, um, and, I, and I, I speak from experience, uh, can tell you, let me tell you, they say that spouses are pregnant. They say, oh, I heard you guys are pregnant. I'm like, sure I am. I don't know how they could put a man in that state, but okay. But an unborn offspring does no good neither to the person that was pregnant, nor to the person that lives with the person that's pregnant. That unborn offspring brings forth discomfort. I remember when my wife was pregnant, I remember when my wife was pregnant, there was these different things that she wanted. Um, I remember when Adam was in my wife's womb, she desired, I don't know how many of you guys remember the New York Deli chips, the purple bag. Um, she also desired sushi. And she desired spicy food. And, and when Adam was born, he came about to be someone who desired the same things. And, and when Adam was born, 
I remember during the process of Adam, Adam's pregnancy, he was big in her womb, and, and my wife would constantly find herself tired. Her, her feet would be tired. They would swell up at times. Um, she would lay, and when she would try to sleep, she would be uncomfortable. And, 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 and just the thought of what was coming in the next coming months, as great as it was, at the same time, I, I got to believe that my wife was thinking, I am going to have to, I'm going to have to go through a metamorphosis in my body to release one of the biggest blessings, but it doesn't come without me going through an extreme amount of pain. There was discomfort when she slept, and anybody who knows anything knows that we like sleeping comfortably, general. There was discomfort when she ate, because during the first trimester of the pregnancy, whatever she ate tried to come back out. And anybody knows anything that right after sleep, it's hunger. I mean, you give me an option, eat or sleep really good, I'll sleep really good. But right after that is like, give me that dessert. You know, so now, now this child, this unborn offspring, is causing discomfort in her sleeping, discomfort in her eating, discomfort in her emotions. Follow me. Because when a woman is pregnant, as beautiful as she is, and as beautiful as she looks to everybody else, in her mind, most of them think, I'm fat. And then the sad part is most of them remain in that state of mind even afterwards, so it becomes that much harder for them to be able to lose that baby fat, to be able to lose that, that whatever they added on. So now you got discomfort in your sleep, you have discomfort in your food, and you have discomfort in your self-esteem. So here you are going through the hardest time of your life. I mean, can you imagine the torture? of someone waking you up every night because they're kicking you in the stomach? Can you imagine the discomfort of you eating your favorite food and someone making you throw it up? Can you imagine the discomfort of knowing that someone is making you feel bad about how you look and, and how you feel? And obviously the parent, the mother, is not going to take it out on the child. They look at the poor husband. They look at the husband and they say, why am I going through what I'm going through? And a lot of us are doing exactly that with God. I, I need you to embrace what I just put forth on this table for you. Even if I stop here at this point, I need you to embrace the picture that I just put forth for you. I need you to understand that there's going to be times where you want to be comfortable, where something is going to wake you up. There's going to be times where you want to enjoy life and you're enjoying the best of your food. Let's talk about when you come to church and God gives you this, this plate of food. And I'm not talking about a physical food, but a spiritual food. And it tastes so good. But something out there makes you throw it back up. Because, you know, you're a Sunday morning goer and you're all into the spirit on Sunday morning. And all of a sudden, Sunday afternoon comes and the enemy comes and tries to get it all out of you and you throw it back up. And, and then what happens is now you start feeling you, this low self-esteem about yourself as a Christian. And you look at all these things and you add them all together. And it brings us all to the point where we realize that though God has planted his seed inside of us and our womb is growing and there's blessing in our womb, there's still a great deal of discomfort going on around us. It's uncomfortable. It's hard at times to understand that God is saying that he will give you a multitude of this or a greatness in this or he's giving you power to do miracles or he's giving you the ability to do this and all you can see is your physical state and you're looking at yourself and you're saying, look at me, I'm fat, I can't move, I can't sleep, I can't eat, I can't do anything. Can anyone relate to that? We're all in this state of discomfort. And we look at it as being something bad. And this morning as I'm driving into church, I just had it out with God. And I said, God, God, God. And all he did was shove my preaching in my face. Because he knows that I'm the only person I'll listen to. So he said, didn't you put this together? And I'm sitting there in my car and I'm saying, fine. Fine, I get it. I get it. I need to go through this. Yes. You are on the brink of giving birth. 
I'm talking about, geez, Louise. Look, our water has broken. Okay? Our water has broken. It is erupted. I don't know how many times you guys have been able to see my poor wife. My wife goes through convulsions at times in the spiritual because as the mother of the house, you know, God will use her symbolically to show where the church is going. And that woman and Miss Deborah has picked up on the same thing. And, and, and they go through these pains, these birthing pangs that I can't relate to. Thank God I can't relate to it. But I see her and I see what she's going through. And I'm telling you today, New Beginnings Ministries in Freeport and Florida, who's watching and anyone else who's watching I'm telling you right now New Beginnings Ministry their water has broken but because the water has broken what has become or what has happened now is that what covered you or lubricated your insides before is no longer there so now what's happening is that everything is more emphasized your pain is more emphasized your drought season is more emphasized. Your night season is more emphasized. Your desert time is more emphasized. The problems you're having at work are more emphasized. The problems you're having at home are more emphasized. The problems you're having with yourself are more emphasized. The problems the doctors are telling you all of a sudden have become more emphasized. Not because you're in the worst place or the worst situation that you've ever been in, but because you're on the brink of entering into your dynasty you're on the brink of entering into your greatness you're on the brink of going from dead to alive you're on the brink of seeing the seed take form in your life have you ever wanted an upgrade from coach to first class ever wanted to have true prosperity If you answered yes to these questions, then you need to come to New Beginnings Ministry, located at 53 Church Street in Freeport, New York, 11510. Contact Felix at newbeginningschurches.com. The event is on December 13th at 5.30 p.m. Come be a part of this illustrative sermon and unlock the upgrade that you deserve. God bless. But it's hard. Yes, it's hard. And it hurts. Yes, it hurts. But glory to God that when this pain is past, we will be able to sit and be able to contemplate the beauty of the blessing of the seed developed in our womb that God placed in us. Yes, in you. In you. You and I were good for nothing before we met Christ. You and I were harlots and whoremongers and other things that I won't even mention from this pulpit. You and I had no value before we entered into Christ. But when we entered into Christ, Christ decided to take it upon himself to make us his showpiece. He said, I'm going to take what everyone else said was good for nothing, and now I'm going to show off. You are what God is going to use to show off. Yes, you. Tell the person next to you, you are his showpiece. You are his showpiece. And you may say, but pastor, you don't understand. Pastor, you don't get it. <laughs> you know, I went to celebrate at a Halloween party and I got plastered, pastor. You sure I'm his showpiece? I'm sure you're his showpiece. You may say, but pastor, come on. I, I fell again last night. I went out clubbing last night, and I had sex with my ex-man again. Oh, uh, guess what? You're still his showpiece. And you may say, but pastor, what are you talking about? I've been having homosexual tendencies. I'm going to tell you something. You're still his, ho his showpiece. Come on. Come on. Come on. You may say, but pastor, you don't know what I had to do. I had to get a fix, and I went out, and I got high last night. You're still his showpiece. You're still his showpiece. And you may say, Pastor, are you crazy? You're saying that from a pulpit? No, I'm not crazy. What I understand is I understand where God took me out from. And I know that if God can change my tendencies and change my mindsets and change the mindsets of all the great leaders and all the great pastors and all the great Christians over time, then he can do the same thing with you. Amen? Because, you know, you don't get behind the pulpit unless you deserve to be in a coffin. You want to be behind the pulpit? You ain't dirty enough. 
I'm not telling you to get dirty. What I'm telling you is the people who are here are here because they were the worst. They were the worst. Abortion after abortion, in the spiritual, in the physical. Sickness after sickness, disease after disease. Let me tell you something. I don't care who you are. I, I, let, let, me tell you, let me just go as far as saying that I am more interested in knowing someone that was able to go through hell and could speak to me about the hell they went through and how they got out than someone who comes up here and opens up 5,000 different books and says, I read about this and I read about that. Congratulations. Keep reading. Tell me what you've lived. Okay, and what's happening right now and what God is doing in the spiritual realm within this church and within your lives is that he's allowing you to live. You know why? Because the explosion, listen well, remember this word, the explosion, la explosion, the explosion that is going to come forth in multiplication over this house is only going to be birthed through your ability to be able to speak about the great things that God has done in your life. God wants you to proclaim the greatness of the healing that took place in your life. God wants wants you to proclaim the greatness that took place in your relationship. You know what I'm talking about. When your spouse cheated on you, yet you were still able to embrace your spouse and you were still able to love your spouse. That's what God wants you to talk about. He wants you to stand up in complete pride and say, yes, I was dead to drugs. I was dead. I was a stripper. I was twerking. I was doing this. I was doing that. But God came into my life and God changed everything that was wrong in me. Come on. Can I get an amen? So here we are in this physical condition where a woman or a female animal is carrying an unborn offspring inside of her body from the fertilization to birth. In other words, from the moment we enter into that process of making love and that moment that we enter into that process of being inseminated, all of a sudden now we go from that moment, there is a foreign object inside of us. There is something that is not of us inside of us. There is a seed that's developed and dropped into our fertilization area into our womb and all of a sudden from that moment on for the transcourse of nine months plus we're carrying something weird inside of us it's not known to us it's foreign to us there's parts of us in it but it's not all us there's parts of us in the promise and, and this is the key and this is look, look, listen to the parts of us you see the parts of us is where you see people like a Jimmy Swaggart and all these great pastors that have had great falls but God lets them get up again you know why because a lot of people say how can they get up on that pulpit every Sunday and how can they do this you see the good part of them is what keeps them going in their gift the great part of God is what allows them to overcome the problems that they've had so that's how people can do it. For those people who say, but how can you be a hypocrite going to church? No, you see, the good part of you keeps you going to church. The great part of God makes you become part of the church. Big difference between coming to church and becoming part of a church. When you become part of a church, you love the church. You do what the church does. You do what you have to do for the church. I'm not talking about these four walls. I'm talking about the kingdom principle of the church. I'm talking about being able to expand the kingdom of God. I'm talking about not expanding the kingdom of NBMI. NBMI has no kingdom. The kingdom that NBMI has is the kingdom of God. That's the kingdom we want to expand. This is not for the riches and glory of any man or any woman. This is for the riches and glory of God. Come on, can I get an amen on that? And, and, and when you and I go through this process... Right? Even though at times we're going to look like we're hypocrites, even though at times you're going to hear people tell you, but don't you see how fat you are? Don't you see all the things that are wrong with you? What are you still doing going to church? And you can look at those people and with the goodness that's inside of you, with the seed that's inside of you, continue to say, you know what? You may see me as being fat, but I see myself as being in process of something greater. You may see me as being a hypocrite, but I see myself in process of becoming better. A lot of people ask me, that they, oh, they'll tell me better yet when we start talking about Christ in the past. And they say, but you got to understand something, Joel. They, they tell me, they go, I, I'm not at that level where I can go into a church yet. And I say, really, what is that level? Well, you know, I got to get this right and I got to get that right. And I say, what is the purpose of going to church when you got everything right? And they say, what do you mean? And I say, exactly that. God is there for the imperfect. You know, recently I put up this thing about, about who should be going to church, and it had everything to do with, with, with the people who are messed up, all of us. You know, you go to church and people say it's full of hypocrites. Correct. 
It's full of liars. Correct. It's full of thieves. Correct. It's full of prostitutes. Correct. It's full of strippers. Correct. It's full of liars. This, that. Yes, you're absolutely right. I'm not arguing with you. We are all there. Together, together, we're making the perfect bride. How? Because God is purging out all the bad from us. But it just doesn't happen overnight. We come to church, and sometimes our lie manifests in church. Yes, it does. Oh, pastor, how can that be? It is. When someone says, pastor, can you believe this? Yeah, I can. It is not a surprise. Oh, did you hear about this? I did. But guess what? That can't stop me from loving the person for who they are. Because it didn't stop him from loving me for who I was. So how can I look at someone as they walk into church and say, oh, that person can't be here. Or how can I look at what they have dressed and be like, oh my gosh, how can she wear that to church? I don't care. Wear whatever you want to wear. I know I'm going crazy in saying that, but you know what? At the end of the day, if I'm the man that I'm supposed to be, then I need to keep my eyes where they should be. Amen? And if you're a woman and you need to be where you need to be, then you need to be where you need to be. As time progresses, God will show you what you should wear and you shouldn't wear. But that should not hinder you from coming into a church. It should not hinder you from doing the will of God. You should do it. Like they say, fake it till you make it. If God calls you to preach, preach in your best outfit, even if you have to wear it every week because you don't have another outfit. But do what you got to do. Amen? Here we go. The key in pregnancy is proximity. You see, look, I, I'm going to give you a little science course. There is no way, well, science today kind of does make it a little easier, but there is no way, no way you can impregnate a woman without actually coming into the closest level of proximity that there is in humanity, becoming one with that person. Amen? It says, the, I don't, come on guys, I'm going to say a big three-letter word right now, sex. Let it out, go ahead. Sex. Sex is the only way that a woman is, getting, getting, is going to be able to get pregnant from a man. It's the only way, sex. Now science today helps with artificial insemination and all that, but that's not God-driven. Now if you need it because of a health reason, go for it, go for it. All right, let me be clear. But what I'm saying here is the, the purpose of relationship and the purpose of proximity is that when you are at that level of proximity there is a union in thought a union in spirit a union in mind the same thing occurs between us and God pastor what are you saying we have sex with God no what I'm saying is that the closest level of intimacy that we have with God is called prayer amen prayer Prayer is an equivalent to a human man and a human woman having sex and being able to conceive. Prayer is our ability to join with God. Why? Because what happens when we pray is we share our heart if you're praying right. If you're going there and you're saying, Father, thou in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Amen. Do your thing. Wear your robe and do that other stuff. But if you really pray and you get into the face of God and you say, God, I don't understand what's going on. I need your help. I'm tired. I'm sick. I'm angry. I'm this. I'm that. All of a sudden now, he sees you for who you are. Not that he didn't see you before, but what you did is that you became vulnerable in his presence. You see, the key to prayer is vulnerability. It's me not coming before God and trying to say, oh, Lord, look at me. I tithe. I give. I do this. I go to church. I do it. He doesn't care about that stuff. I mean, he does, but he doesn't care about it when you go into his presence for prayer. All he wants to hear is is your mouth saying, Lord, I need this. Lord, I want this. Lord, I thank you for that. Lord, I thank you for this. He knows who you are. He just wants you to get to the point where you're open enough to say, Lord, I'm angry. I deal with anger. I deal with lust. I deal with perversion. I deal with this. I deal with that. And he wants you to, he wants you to express that. And you say, but pastor, why would God want to know all that? Because he wants you to be vulnerable in his presence. You want to be intimate? You know, a, a lot of people, and I, I know I'm going to get a little freaky here, a lot of people turn off the lights when they go into the process of conceiving because they have low self-esteem of their bodies, of who they are, of what they look, the stretch mark they might have, or the little love, the, the muffin top that they might have and all that good stuff. Come on. But in the presence of God, God wants his light on. Why? Because his light is not there to magnify, and, and you got to catch this, it's not there to magnify your sin and your wrong, it's there to magnify the change that he's made in your life. Soak it in. When God brings light into your life, it's not to point out all the wrong and say, why are you so wrong? I'm going to strike you now. 
What he's doing is he's turning on the light so that you can see who you were and who you are now. Because that's going to motivate you to get closer to him because you're going to be able to say, wow, look at the conversion that you've done in my life. That's worship. I'm going to worship you for converting me from who I was to who I am. Not, Lord, I'm going to get close to you because look at all the wrong that's in me and, and, and only you can receive me this way. No, no. Thank you, Lord. I mean, that's great, but thank you, Lord. I want to worship my way into your bedroom, Lord, because I want to show you my gratitude for the conversion process that has taken place in my life. Because where I thought back there that I would never be over there, somehow, some way, without even noticing, you allowed me to get where I am today. That makes you googly eye over God. That makes you look at God and say, whoa! And not only does it give you that woe feeling, but it makes you run around town saying, my man is the best man. What man is that? Jesus. J-E-S-U-S. He is the best of them. He is the only one. I don't need to look at no one else because he's got everything I want and then some. Can I get an amen? When we look around, when we look around, and we contemplate what this world offers, what we're saying is, God, you look great, but there is no buts. And I got something else to tell you. Watch this. This week, I sent out a devotional about a cup, and it talked about how you can't drink from the cup of the world and the cup of the demons. Amen? I'm going to take it a step further. Once you're impregnated with the seed of God, you cannot become impregnated with the seed of another. Even in the physical, once a woman is pregnant, she's pregnant. There's no second do's. There's no do-overs. It's done. She's pregnant. In the spiritual, you may go and you may fornicate or adulterate with another situation. But let me tell you something. Nothing is going to change that seed that's inside of you. The seed that was planted by God cannot be changed. It cannot be modified. It cannot be swayed. That seed is permanent. It's permanent. Why am I saying this? And pastor, why are you reiterating this today? Because there's someone in this house today that needs to understand that despite your mistakes or despite my mistakes, maybe it's me, despite all the issues that we've been going through, God's feelings and love for us has not changed. The key in pregnancy is proximity. How close are we to God? Genesis 4.1, reading out of the amplified verse, at, uh, Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. It says, and Adam knew Eve as his wife. Listen to that. And Adam knew Eve as his wife. And she became pregnant and bore Cain. And she said, I have gotten and gained a man with the help of the Lord. Again, and Adam knew. See, that's the key to know. You become impregnated when you know. I know in the day and age that we live in today, we have a lot of one-night stands. That's a constant or a common thing to know to, to humanity. One-night stands are very, very frequent. People don't know who they're sleeping with when it's a one-night stand. But isn't it interesting how any, any produce that comes forth from a one-night stand is never appreciated love and is mostly discarded? Many Christians today, watch this, attempt to have one-night stands with God. What are you talking about? What I'm talking about is they make Sunday mornings their one night stand. I come in, I flirt with God. I come in, I pray to God. I come in, I feel a little bit of God. You ever felt that brush of God? You know what I'm talking about? That brush that makes every goosebump in your body rise up, every hair stand up, and you're like, whoa. But then a lot of us, and notice how I say us, we leave here. And we had a good time flirting with God. It was like we speed dated with God. And we walk out and we say, I'll see you when I see you. I don't even need your number. I'll just, I'll come back when I'm ready. In Christianity, we can't have one night stands with God. Because we're never going to have the result that we truly desire and want. When you have a one-night stand with someone, the reason you're having that one-night stand with them is because they don't truly complete what you want. They're just completing a meaningless lust in your life. We can't lust God. We got to love God. 
When you have one night stands is because you're playing the field as they call it and you're trying to experience things in different places to see which one fits better. I got some news for you. God is the only one that's going to fit into your equation. The only one. Watch this. Reading the same verse, Genesis chapter 4, verse 1 out of the NIV. Listen to what it says. It says, Adam made love to his wife Eve and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Do you see the differences? One is new, one is made love. So we have to equate the fact that to know someone is to make love with someone. And to make love with someone is different than to have sex with someone. When you make love with someone, you're at an emotional level and you're here, one-on-one -on -one together. Your thought is the correct thought. It's not, let me just do this and get it over with. It's let me enjoy my time with my spouse, with my partner. Spouse. I'm not advocating fornication. When we come before the presence of God, we can't, and I know I'm, I'm, I'm rattling a lot of religious cages right now, and I apologize, but you can't have sex with God. You got to make love to God. Sex with God means your prayer is meaningless. Sex with God is what I was talking about being religious before, where all you're doing is coming forth and reading out something that you learned from someone else that recited the same thing over and over and over and over. There's no meaning behind it. It's just a job. It's just a routine. It's just, this is the way it is, and this is the way I do it. No, no, no. With love, everything changes. It's not about the action. It's about the connection. It's about the ability to focus in with that person. It's about the ability to come before God and say, here I am. I love you. I'm going to become vulnerable before your presence. I want your seed in me. I want you in me. I want everything about you in me. I, I just, I want to be closer to you. This times, man... Where, and, and I'm not talking sexually, but there's times where, I, you know, especially in the past, you know, and, and it's got to be like that in the future too. But there's times where I grab my wife and I say, and I, I think I've told her a couple of times, I want to kind of make her small and put her in my pocket. I haven't done that enough lately, and I apologize for that. I do have to do that. But, you know, there's times where you get so close to someone, so, so just in love with someone that you just want to kind of minimize them, put them in your pocket and just be able to look at them and be like, hi. Right? And that's how we got to be with God. We got to want to just take God and, and we're the little ones in his pocket, but we just got to want to carry God with us everywhere we go and be like, God, I'm right here. I'm right here. I see you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I just need a little bit. I just need a little pequito, as they say in Spanish, a little, a little something. Do you understand? Just having that proximity to him. And, and, and that's the way you're able to go from a woman and a man to a woman and a man and a family. There's a big difference between a single and a single. It, when you get together and you become one, all of a sudden now you're able to duplicate yourself and duplicate yourself and duplicate yourself. That only comes through pregnancy. Here, Adam knew Eve. Here, Adam made love to Eve. And here they were able to conceive a child. There's a result that comes forth from intimacy. That result in this case was Abel, and then Cain, and then Seth, and on and on went the lineage. It didn't stop with just Adam and Eve. God doesn't want it to stop between just you and Him. Hear me. He doesn't want it to be just Joel and Jesus. He doesn't want it to be just Wayne and Jesus. He wants it to be Joel and Jesus, and they created another. Because the testimony that Jesus did in Joel and the process of impregnation that took place in Joel and the promise that came forth all of a sudden birthed something else and someone else that was able to come in and now they went from their position to Jesus and now they came into the fold and now they gave birth to another and that went, went over to another and another and another and another. The process of becoming pregnant is for duplication. God has not called the church to be sterile. God has called us to multiply. Multiply. God is not a God of addition. He's a God of multiplication. We talked about Adam and Eve, and we talked about how Adam knew Eve, or how Adam made love to Eve, right? Do we really know him? Have we been able to really know God? 
for you to be able to make love to someone, there's one component that's necessary, and what's that? Love. If you ain't got no love, you ain't going to make love. You got to have love. If love is not existent, then there's no love that's going to be able to take place. How much do we really love God? You know, some years back, I'm going to say probably in the 80s, there was a movie. Um, this movie was called The Seventh Sign. It was by Demi Moore. I don't know how many of you guys remember it. It was based on this concept that, that there was this place called the Gulf, and the Gulf was a place of souls, and, and that place was empty. And I'm just giving you a quick idea so you understand the sacrifice that's behind this. And, and Demi Moore ended up becoming impregnated, and she was the last of the souls. She was it. So she had to be able to give birth and she had to be able to die for that child. Die for that offspring. Die for the product of her giving. And a lot of times we realize the, the death and life of Jesus on the cross of Calvary and we realize what he did for us. We realize the greatness of the, of the sacrifice that he made on that cross for us. But we don't want to die. And, and I say that because I came out of a church that all they talked about was dying. Die to your flesh, die to your flesh, die to your flesh. Uh, you almost felt like you had to cut yourself like they did in the times of Baal and Asteroid. And, and you had to walk around hurting yourself because that's the only way that, that things will feel right. It's not about hurting yourself in the physical. It's not about cutting yourself. It's not about making yourself feel bad. I mean, if someone came up to you and said, oh, great preaching, you were supposed to be like, no, all the glory to God, and that's it. Amen. Amen. Praise God. If you study for something and you do a good job, praise God. But also, you know what? Congratulations. The death that I want to talk about, or the death that I want to uh, um, allow you to visualize through this, this birth, this small clip of this video, and I'm not endorsing the movie or nothing like that. I just, I'm making a point with the birth. Um, is that death that we have to give to God every day. And that death that I'm talking about is not a physical thing. It's, it's a heart thing. It's being able to disconnect from things that you and I both know are bad for us. It's like me telling... It's like my son having a car and me telling my son, you know, you're putting oil in your gas tank. You have to stop putting oil in your gas tank. And then what I do is instead of him continue to put oil in his gas tank, I start putting gas in it. He puts oil. He's, he's dying. He's, he's killing himself. I'm telling you, no, no, no. You, you got to put gas. And, and then he's going to allow me to start putting gas in. All of a sudden now he's dying to what he thought because he thought oil was the way, but he realizes it's gas. So he's dying to his thought. You see, a lot of us are putting oil in our gas tank. And God is saying, I, I want you to die to your flesh. But the death to your flesh is not you saying, here's my car. Let me hit it so it can hurt. It's rather me saying, God, here's my car. Can you fill it with what it needs? That's your promise. That child is symbolism of your promise. Will you let God put gas in your gas tank? Will you stop, will I stop shoving oil in a gas tank that's doing nothing for us. Would we be willing to die for that promise? Would we be willing to allow God to change our lives for that promise? The promise is going to come forth one way or the other. The question is, when the promise comes forth, is it going to be effective or is it going to die away? In this morning, I want to leave you with this picture, birth into your mind. Because as the weeks progress, we're going to talk about things like post-mature births and, and premature births and things like that and, and, and connect them into the spiritual. I know this is a little bit weird for some of us. Some of us is a little bit uncomfortable. But you have to understand the process of your promise coming forth. And you have to understand why you've been going through what you've been going through. You and I have to understand why we've been going through the pain that we've been going through. I know I can't be the only one. Thank you for joining the NBMI experience today. Like, comment, and subscribe at www.facebook.com front slash NBMINY or our YouTube channel at www.youtube.com front slash NBMICHURCH 
Also check out our new and improved website at www.newbeginningschurches.com. And finally, check out our new awesome church app, available on both Android and Apple platforms. Search your app store for NBMICHURCH and be blessed.